The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3Advance, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3Advance. They're incredible. Go to 3Advance.com. That's the number 3Advance.com. Empire. Data is pouring in. How teams use it, that has many layers. To win the game is not only about um, playing good basketball and, and have the, the right strategy or tactics, but also have um, um, healthy and good performing with a high fitness level of the athlete. That's Mehdi Bentenfus, CEO of Connexon, who believes teams need a complete picture to understand how best to win on and off the court. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. Mehdi Bentenfus believes his company is way ahead of the analytics game. You'll hear why and how in a bit. And later, the SEC is in an athletic arms race, but not in their traditional power sport of football, but on the diamond. We'll hear how Auburn is modernizing their program. But first, the future is now with the ending that has the basketball world thinking it's a new beginning. So the NBA played around with how the All-Star game was going to conclude, and it's been a rousing success. Dan Walken's a columnist for USA Today, and he wrote an opinion piece called The NBA Should Be Even More Experimental After the All-Star Game Success. Hey, Dan, how are you? Good, how are you? We've been following the Elam ending for a while here on this show, and frankly, I'm a little bit surprised that it hasn't gotten more notoriety, but it's going to now. Um, let's start with generally, what was your takeaway of the use of it in the All-Star Game? Well, I thought it was great. I thought it was something that enhanced the whole atmosphere and the effect of, of the way that game was played. I think the players, uh, and I'm sure there were other factors involved, certainly the Kobe Bryant death uh, was one of them, but players played really hard. And, you know, I do think that, that when you set a number as opposed to a time, it does sort of impact the mentality of how players approach each possession and because you can't just run out the clock you actually have to find ways to keep scoring and that and that makes it strategic it makes it competitive uh you've got to figure out how to how to have good possessions and, and put the ball in the basket and and then the other team you know they, they have still an incentive to to play defense and and try to prevent you from getting to that number so uh, i i think um the ending worked as it intended. It doesn't mean it would be awesome every single time, but at least in that moment, it was a, a big deal that the Elam ending uh, was so effective in, in the way that uh, game ended. As you've talked to people within the league following this, um, and I don't want to get too far ahead, but do you get the sense that they are excited about implementing this more into the regular season and potentially the playoffs? I think it's premature to go that far, but I think that there's, definitely going to be more conversation around okay we have this thing we know that there's some benefit to it uh what do we do with it now and what's too much what's too far and i'm sure those are the conversations that are being had in within the nba's uh, offices and you know they've got people who study and do the data on all this stuff and and certainly you know the 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 gamble as it was paid off for them in the all-star game. So uh, I'm sure that they're going to have some, some talks about, you know, where to implement this uh, and in what ways, but I, I'm not sure it's progressed far enough to even speculate on, on what that might be uh, and whether or not you could ever see it in a real NBA game. Um, off of the experience though, you wrote a piece that you said the league should be even more experimental. Um, what did you mean by that? The thing about sports is, you know, these games were not handed down to us on stone tablets. You know, they're invented, and as we evolve, the game should evolve. And, 
you know, there was a time when the three point line was considered uh, heresy. You know, now it's just part of the game uh, because it makes it better. You know, tennis, it used to be there was no such thing as a tie break in tennis. And so, you know, at Wimbledon, you'd have sets that end, you know, 13 11 all the time. And then someone invented a tie break and it makes it better. So, those sort of evolutions and inventions are not new. And we, we can't just sort of cling to tradition and say, well, this is the way it's always been done, so this is the way it's always got to be done. That, that's nonsense, and that's not the way sports should work. So I, I'm all in favor of the NBA trying things. And they've got this, this kind of lab experiment in, in the G League that they can work off of. They've got summer leagues. They've got all kinds of things where – you can take a look at whether it's a rule change or a, uh, something like the Elam ending or um, you know, different ways to you know, police uh, the lane or you know, widening the lane or all, all kinds of things you can do uh, that, that ultimately may or may not make their way to the NBA based on how successful they are. And I, I like change. I like people trying things. And if, if it doesn't work, you can always, you can always go back. Dan Walken wrote a really intriguing piece off of the success of the All-Star game and the changes they made to the format. It's called The NBA Should Be Even More Experimental After the All-Star Game Success. Dan, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Up next, Mehdi Bentonfus on getting a complete look at the athlete on and off the court. This is the Future Sport Podcast. Our guest this week is the CEO of Connexon, Mehdi Bentonfus. His company claims itself to be the first and so far only sports performance monitoring and analytics provider on the market that covers the complete range of performance data for team sports, and they got a lot of relationships to prove it. Hey, Mehdi, how are you? Thanks for being here. Thank you, Bram. Uh, thanks for having me. I think the word complete range is probably the part we underline here. Uh, when you say there's a complete range of data that you guys are monitoring, what do you mean by that? The complete range is basically the combination of um, uh, the player and the ball movement, as well as the performance and the technical side. Um, um, in, in, in order to uh, to, com- to understand the, the, the game uh, better and to have a competitive edge, uh, you need to uh, track or know the movement of your player, but as well as the ball. Um, and with the tracking of both sides, we're able to understand the game better, um, to understand the performance of, of the athlete, but also from a tactical pers- perspective, understand my game, the opponent's game, and have a competitive edge at the end in order to win games. So, uh, and, and you guys are doing this in real time, right? So this is not, there's no delay in the information being shared. Absolutely. So um, this is the uniqueness of the Kinexon solution is that the data we provide is within milliseconds. So basically, um, we have the information, the metric, the stats, uh, while the game is happening, and the coaches can make decisions instantly based on the data that, that they're seeing. And this is also why the Kinexon system is interesting, not only for sports teams, but also for leagues, is that the data can be used um, live um, during the game in integration with the media side, the broadcasting, or even uh, other channels. Um, and that makes it also interesting from a fan engagement perspective. Uh, I'll get to the broadcasting stuff in a minute because that's interesting. Because I, I think, as you know, and, and as I know in the broadcasting field, that all of that type of data and dissemination of it is changing. But let, let me stay on the teams for a moment. Obviously, you're not the only group that is monitoring movement and trying to provide data to teams. Why is Connexon different? Um, there are different aspects um, to, uh, to consider here. Um, first of all, uh, if we look at the indoor sports, um, the, the data quality uh, that Kinexon provides um, is proven consistently higher than any other wearable technologies out there. Uh, we were able to, pro- to, to show that the, the quality of the metrics and the reliability of the data, which is extremely important for the coaches, um, is very high. And that's why if you look at our 
um, track record in the MBA. We've been able to um, work um, within the last two and a half years. We started with one team, and now we're working with more than 22 teams. Um, so the data reliability is, is one topic. The other aspect is how useful the information that you're providing. And the metrics and the analysis that, that we provide has been extremely helpful for, for the coaches so far. And this has also helped us getting more traction, not only in the NBA, but in, in, in other sports as well. Um, and the third point is the integration of other data points. We believe that not only the, the data that we're collecting uh, with the movement for ball and player um, is enough, but to, in, to in, the integration of data, for example, like parametric data, like the heart rate, but also um, shot data in the NBA with the, our integration with the, with the RSPCT or the RESPECT system, um, to have all the layers or all the different information synchronized with the data that we provide, that provides a unique um, um, data set for the coaches, and that makes um, Kinexon um, so that made Kinexon successful in the market. What are the challenges that are different about trying to do this with outdoor sports? Um, that's a very good question. The um, the outdoor sports has been, um, I would say, also successful uh, for Kinexon in in other countries than in the U.S. For instance, with the soccer in uh, in Germany. But the 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 the, um, the, the challenge here is that. Um, the, the market has been already uh, entered by GPS companies, and um, uh, these companies focused on the soccer, the American football, the rugby market in the past, uh, and that made the market entry for Kinexon um, a little bit more challenging than the indoor sports where there was no technology, um, similar technologies out there. Um, but we, we're experiencing now um, a... Uh, uh, a shift from the interest on the GPS to technology like ours that is based on uh, radio, radio frequencies and that provide not only the real-time aspect of the data but also a very high quality of the data. Uh, obviously, with using radio frequency and the technology of ultra-wideband that, that the Kinexon uh, sensor has, uh, we're able to provide extremely higher data quality or data accuracy um, than the GPS systems out there. So I've asked this from others who are providing data to people, and I wonder what your thoughts are on it. You're, you're talking about real-time data. There's a possibility that coaches and teams could adjust very quickly to whatever the data is suggesting to them. Um, how difficult was it to first collect it, but then put it in a way that they could use it in real time and understand the data that they were receiving? The challenge is, is, is also about what kind of metrics um, I would uh, look at for different sports. Obviously, the movement in the different sports um, is very different. Um, um, the court or the field size is different. The, the type of movement is also different, and that's why the metrics that we look at um, are very different. And the challenge is to find the right information um, that helps me understand what the athlete is doing uh, is doing on the court, and uh, that's that has been um, a long research from our side, and also uh, with the help with a lot of experts in the different sports, um, in order to uh, get the right information to to the coaches. Um, and obviously, the the information that we that we're collecting has been new in the market, and the teach it, it, it's kind of a teaching process to. Um, show the the coaches what does this information mean and how can you make decision based on that uh, and this is changing with the with the education and and the 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 um, the type of data that that the um, that the coaches are looking at more and more um, we see this for instance in NCAA where data in five years or six years ago was not important and now most of the performance coaches uh, are looking at data, for instance, in basketball, like um, the, uh, the speed, the acceleration, the explosiveness of the player, uh, the change of direction. This type of data have, have wasn't, wasn't available and, and was not looking, looked at in the past, and this is changing in the market. You know, it's interesting. I, it's funny because we, we do this and we're covering this here and, you, and you're living it with a company like this. And when I hear of teams that, that still are not on board with collecting some form of data, I, I don't know how they even compete any longer. 
Um, um, absolutely. I mean, we, we see that that the benefits of of the data has has now proven that the the teams are getting a competitive uh, competitive edge. Um, let's look at the, the just the performance of the athletes and the number of injuries that a team has when he does use the data and a team that doesn't use the data. Um, obviously, the uh, the um, the to, to win the game is not only about um, playing good basketball and, and have the, the right strategy or tactics, but also have um, um, healthy and good performing with a high fitness level of the athletes. And now the teams that are not using the data are seeing more and more challenges to compete on a higher level, on, on a high level, if they're not using the type of data that other teams are, are, are already using. So this, um, this mentality is, is really changing because the data at, at the end is is useful not only for the performance but but also for the head coach to um, to have this one step ahead of the other teams in order to win the game. So um, the data it's not a nice to have anymore. It's it's a mandatory tool to be used in order to have a competitive team um, uh, within within their peers. Now, you had mentioned injuries, and, and obviously you guys aren't in the business of, of helping people recover or that, but you are in the business somewhat of trying to get avoidance, and that is load management. And I think you and I both know, you know, as a broadcaster, I've watched how this has been portrayed publicly, and it comes off in some ways as the players are trying to take nights off or shorten their season, and I think you probably know that that's not really what's happening here, right? Uh, absolutely not. Um, the, um, the, um, the, the, from, from our perspective, and, and we look at, uh, at the data also, we, we do not only provide the solution, but also provide consulting for our, for our teams um, in order to show them um, what's going on on the, on the court and who, is, uh, has, who shows the fatigue level and who is not. And um, the, the, uh, the team or the players are looking at being fit and not being exposed to injuries throughout throughout the season and throughout their career life. And um, the, the decision are not now you know, taking days off, but also based on the data that, that we're looking at, we see um, how the, the, uh, the, uh, the load can lead or a higher extreme load can lead very quickly to an injury. There are many cases out there where the data has proven that um, uh, managing the load can definitely lead to l- less injury likelihood, um, and that's why the, the load management becomes very important um, in order to have a healthy player throughout the season or throughout his career and not expose him to um, risky um, uh, injuries. You know, what's interesting about this, and I'm, I'm seeing this kind of develop here, that the conversation is changing about it, because it always was you play through something or someone's toughness was questioned. And the data and the science is suggesting that is really the wrong attitude to go about this. And it'll be interesting if we head down a path where the length of the season becomes something that feels untenable to players. Yes, but absolutely. The question is not about the length of the season or about the, the, the number of games, but it's about how do I um, how do I structure the season? How do I put the games uh, the game schedule? Um, how do I uh, organize the, the travel? And this is why this data is extremely useful. We can now with with, uh, with collecting data for uh, for all the, the the last few seasons, the last three to four seasons we are able to see where are the red flags and how can we can we organize adapt the not only the season but also just the training schedule of of uh, of, of a team based on the data that 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 we are collecting and and that's why um uh, we will see as we uh, as we progress and as we collect the data more and more understanding of why um a um, a um uh, a, a, a league should be scheduled that way or a season should be scheduled that way and why sometimes a player has to play less minutes than uh, than he usually did because of his fitness and, and fatigue level. And there are so many factors out there that are important for uh, for such uh, for, for such a development and um, the, the, the players also become more and more aware and as they understand the data of why the, 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 the coaches made such decisions. 
Uh, let's get into the broadcast partners for a minute. Um, what do they want from you? What, what are they looking for out of the data and the information? The, the broadcast, or let's say, let's say the media, the media side, also the leagues, they are looking at um, how to enhance the fan experience. Um, and also how to make the sports more interesting and entertaining. And uh, that's why live data be becomes here very interesting, is to provide new type of stats and new type of products in order to make the sports more, first of all, understandable and also more exciting. Let's take it as an example of a very uh, unique um, sports like um, the bike bike riding um, or the X fighters of, of uh, that where th there is an artistic um, jump on on a bike and where th there is there are um, uh, referees that give um, let's say or judges that give um, a um, a score. This the the sport itself is very interesting. Um, it's very inter uh, very very look nice to look at, but it's not understandable at all. So if you provide new type of data about how high the jump was, about the speed of the biker, about, about the um, the airtime of, of the jump, and so on and so forth, you're able to make the sports more understandable and people to more people to follow the sports. So that's just an exotic example, but this applies to um, American football, to ice hockey, where we would like to to track the park and the player to, to, to get more information uh, and basketball to get more than the ball st stats that, that we know, but more of performance stats to see how actually good is, is a player from a performance side and how explosive he is and how much uh, energy he's putting into the game. And uh, this means that the live, uh, this means that live data will be, um, will be more and more interesting in the future and the technology made it make it now possible to do so um, we know that uh, there are many um, leagues and conferences that are using technologies out there but you don't see that much live data out of it uh, and this is because of the technology is not real-time ready yet and the quality of data it wasn't reliable enough with the new technologies out there and one of them is Kinexon is, is we are able to provide within milliseconds information to the broadcaster to show it to the fans or we de to develop new type of products that are AR, VR based um, with a 5G implementation for instance that makes it even more possible to get these new type of products out there to, to the fans. And, um, and at the end the ultimate goal is make the sports more interesting and grow the fan base for the sport. Mehdi Bettenfuss is the CEO of Connexon. Thanks so much for joining us, Mehdi. Thank you, Brian. Have a good day. Up next, Jason Caldwell from 247 Sports on the Auburn Tigers, trying to be the LSU football of SEC baseball. This is the Future Sport Podcast. So let's take a minute here to thank our friends at 3 Advance. These guys are ranked one of the nation's top app developers, but that's not all. They've helped grow a bunch of sports tech startups like Team Builder, T-Box Tour, and In-Game Fantasy, but they're also experts in user experience, cloud APIs, and artificial intelligence. So if you're looking for a dev partner to bring your future sport tech to life, look these guys up. Go to 3advance.com. They're the team to make it happen. At Advance, you will. That's the number 3advance.com. And tell them Future Sport sent you. Analytics, it's coming everywhere, even down to the SEC, where Auburn's baseball team is playing a little money ball themselves these days. Jason Caldwell wrote a piece about it. He's part of the Inside the Auburn Tigers and part of the 247 Sports Network. Hey, Jason, how are you? Thanks for joining us. I'm doing good, Ram. How are you? Uh, what's the baseball program doing these days? Yeah, uh, well, unfortunately for them, coming off a uh, pretty rough weekend over the weekend against a, a good UCF team. But, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's growing and maturing in every facet. And, and you know, as you, as you mentioned, it's, starts and, and right now with with analytics the way those things are kind of 
blowing up in every sport and, and for Auburn baseball that's part of kind of this learning curve I think for everybody involved um, it's kind of transferred down from major league level minor league level all these were areas and now it's uh it's it's pretty much a it's here and here to stay on the collegiate level as well. So when you say learning curve, was this something they were resistant to? What are they implementing now that they weren't in the past? No, really. For I think one of the one of the keys for Auburn has been, you know, head coach Butch Thompson was one of the the first um, college baseball pitchers when uh, pitching coaches, excuse me, when he was at Mississippi State as an assistant, uh, they had TrackMan installed there because he wanted to know what his pitchers were doing, um, spin rate on breaking balls, all those things, and you know, velocity, how, how it was maintaining it, and to have it more than just a radar gun. And so he has been a guy that's been at the forefront of those things um, before, but now it's the learning curve with everything else involved, whether it's blast motion, you know, all these things that now from a, a hitter standpoint, it's normally been, hey, here's your spin rate on, on pitches, those kind of things. Now you're, you're talking about bat speed um, increases, um, the the plane of, of your swing, swing plane, all those things where your hands are before and after, um, and, and getting that instantaneously. You know They can do that after practices and send it directly to players' phones, let them watch themselves on video, do all that. And then and now with the, the, the advent of virtual reality, they can actually stand in the box and see a pitcher, if they have that guy on video, can see him and and – physically almost take pitches and see those pitches coming into the box so yeah it's been a learning curve is because technology never slows down i think it's kind of trying to keep up and really the big thing for them has been what do we what do we implement try not to overwhelm the kids but have a way to filter it so you can help them out in in the in the best way possible without kind of bogging them down um, is this something that that has kind of become commonplace in the SEC, or is Auburn trying to get ahead of the curve here? Yeah, I, you know, I, I haven't talked to a whole lot of other people around the league yet. Um, knowing this league, and, and it's usually ahead of the times, I would say that probably everybody or, or a lot of the, the top schools, if you're talking about an LSU or Arkansas or Mississippi State, those schools, I would say they're probably all trying to um, get a grasp of, of this next wave of analytics as well. But I haven't, I haven't going around and seeing anybody just yet I'll, I'll get a, a better sense of that once they get into the league schedule but I would say that that this league probably uh, as much as anybody you're trying to to trying to jump ahead and I would think that probably more people than just Auburn are, are, are trying to do those things as well I mean clearly look the SEC is it's bread and butter is it's football um, where does baseball rank in terms of investment into successful programs yeah um, I would say as far as around the country there's nobody that's even close to the SEC. Um, obviously, it's not close to football and, and, you know, behind men's basketball. But if you're talking about comparative to the other leagues around the country, the Southeastern Conference is far and away the, the, the league that, that invests the most money in baseball. And when you look at the stadiums, you look at, at um, the money that's poured into those in this league and the upkeep, all those things. Yeah, when you're talking about um, – you know Auburn on on the smaller end, averaging you know thirty five to four thousand, uh, thirty five hundred four thousand fans for home games, where you're looking at at ten thousand plus at many schools, and that would be um, a couple of weeks worth at, at you know some Pac twelve schools, some of those now you know some of those obviously Oregon State for the world, some of those are are there, and there's there's pick and choose some areas around the country. But as far as a league overall, um, yeah, nobody's even close to the SEC in terms of, of what they put into baseball programs. Jason Caldwell from Inside the Auburn Tigers, which is part of the 247 Sports Network. Thanks so much, Jason. Appreciate it. Thank you. That will do it for us this week. As always, the future is now. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3Advance, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3Advance. They're incredible. Go to 3Advance.com. That's the number 3Advance.com.